Hi, I'm James McGuire, editor of Datamation, and our topic today is open source cloud computing. We've got some major industry leaders to talk about that. Uh, with us today is uh, Devin Carlin. Devin is the founder and CTO of Nebula. Hello to you, Devin. Thank you very much for having me today. Uh, Gordon Half is the cloud computing evangelist at Red Hat. Uh, Gordon, you're actually an evangelist, huh? Yep, that's what they call me. <laughs> lo lo love that job title. Uh, Martin Mikos is CEO of Eucalyptus Systems. Hello to you, Martin. Hello, everybody. And uh, Peter Ulander is VP of Open Source at Citrix. Hello to you, Peter. Good to see you guys. So, you know, the, the topic is, you know, why open source cloud computing? I mean, if you're, if you're going to build a private cloud, I'm assuming we're, we're mainly talking about private cloud, and correct me if I'm wrong about that, but say you're going to build a private cloud in your own data center, why choose open source as opposed to a, a proprietary solution, and is part of this cost? I mean, please answer the question also in terms of cost. Uh, Martin, what, what's your sense of that? Why, why use open source cloud computing software? Well, I think it's it's remarkable that cloud computing and private cloud is a new industry segment, and it's completely dominated by open source. And this shows that when you develop really advanced open source infrastructure software, nothing beats open source. So we have four strong projects in just one category, and all of them are ahead of all the closed source offerings in the market. So that in itself is a is a huge testament to the power of open source and also the power of the developers and sysadmins who adopt them. They refuse to adopt uh, solutions where they can't look under the hood and see the code. You're saying the, the open source is far ahead of proprietary solutions. I'm assuming someone on the other side of the fence would argue with that assumption? I'm very happy to argue with them and I will let the customers argue. Go and ask VMware how much they have deployments of their product VCD. Um, for the size of the company, it's it's minuscule what they've done so far, and mm -hmm. it's a good project. So don't take me wrong. I'm not saying they can't get it right, right, but but this is one of the first areas in software where open source is clearly the innovator and in the lead, and it's not just one open source project; it's four of them. Hmm. Devin, what's your sense of that? Why why, why open source for for cloud computing? And, and we are mainly talking about private cloud, correct, sir? Uh, yeah, in the context uh, where we're coming from, yeah. Uh, and to give a little background there, when we created uh, Nova, which became the compute uh, portion of the OpenStack project uh, in my early days at NASA, um, you know, the, the amount of uh, response and rally we got from the community and the amount of uh, rapid growth we saw there, uh, it just told us we were in the right place at the right time and that, you know, there are a number, a number of other open source uh, projects in this space and they're all, you know, they're all relevant and they're all doing well. But if you look at just how fast they're growing, that's just the market and the community speaking uh, to the need there. Peter, what, what, why open source cloud? Is, is there a really advantage here? You know, and, so, and what, what, what about cost? I guess I would also ask. What, what, yeah, what's your sense on cost here? Uh, I'm happy to cover all of that. So, I mean, you know, ultimately when we started the company, we took a quick look at, you know, effectively what were the most successful clouds that had, had launched. Um, and, you know, four, four years ago you're looking at uh, the Amazons, the Salesforces, um, the Yahoo's, the Google's, all building up various types of services from the infrastructure layer all the way out through the uh, software as a service layer. And when you really looked at the underpinnings of this stuff, it was based on open source technologies. Um, and that was because they were able to leverage from innovators uh, in various communities. It wasn't just one project. It was a multitude of projects um, that were uh, kind of helping push this stuff forward. It gave them better control over feature services and functions that they wanted to go build um, and it met the cost needs. You weren't paying uh, the crazy license fees um, that were associated from the virtualization layer all the way through the operating sister system layer that enabled them to go build businesses. And if you look at the early days of Amazon even, um, Amazon wasn't first to market. There were four others that joined them almost at the exact same time. Amazon's the only ones left. Um, and that has a lot to do with the economics, the developers, and the ecosystem that, that built around that. So when we started CloudStack, we knew from the start that in order to manage costs, um, leverage innovation happening in various communities, um, and lower the barriers of adoption to the enterprise um, or service providers, we actually serve both markets on that one, James, and we've seen uh, that open source has taken off both private and public clouds. Um, uh, open source licensing, open source development models, and, and that open ecosystem model has proved to be very beneficial to the CloudStack project. Is there a way, I mean, you did touch on a cost a little there, but is there a way to 
you know, roughly quantify if, if the proprietary solution costs X, then open source is going to be X minus percentage, or is it just too big a vast a question? You know what I mean? You can break down costs across the board, right? And at the end of the day, the license fees are the absolute minimal. Um, you know, when you're comparing cost of, uh, of infrastructure, of, of uh, um, uh, cooling and, and, and um, uh, building space and administrative costs, all that stuff. That's actually where the costs really come, and it doesn't matter whether it's open source or, or proprietary at that point. I can easily say that I think all four of us have a license that's one-tenth of what VMware might deliver, but it's, it's uh, small in comparison to the other costs. I think it really comes back to control and innovation and leverage, and that's actually what open source um, brings more. So it's more of an opportunity cost than it is a physical cost, I guess. Mm -hmm. Gordon, why open source? I mean, leverage, control, cost? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think if you look back at sort of when Red Hat was getting started, and I think really kind of how open source came onto the market, it was very much about essentially commoditizing proprietary products. Linux did it with Unix. Um, MySQL, for example, did it with Oracle. But I think what we've really seen in the last few years, and this is true of cloud, it's true of um, big data loosely, is the innovation is happening in open source. I mean, yeah, there's innovation still happening here and there in proprietary products, but is the open source development model and the ability for users, for vendors, for communities of developers to come together that has really made open source so powerful, and it's really just the way increasingly that software is developed and deployed. Why, why is open source doing more cutting edge stuff? Is it just the community of developers? I mean, why wouldn't a, you know a highly paid team of proprietary developers be able to, to top that? What is it about the open source that makes it more cutting edge? I, yeah, I'm not stealing someone else's line. I just don't remember off the top of my head who said it. But you can hire smart people if you're a proprietary software company. You can't hire all the smart people. Uh, mm. The the just the ability. And you know, I'm not going to name specific open source projects here, but oh, come on, if you, <laughs> but well, I mean, well, let's talk about Linux, for example, and kind of stay out of the cloud space. I mean, the number of different developers, different companies, and users, for that matter, not just vendors, who are coming together to solve their own problems is just incredible. And you just don't get that kind of interaction, innovation, increasingly in the proprietary space. The other issue here is uh, interoperability and, and compatibility. Those, those are big issues in today's data center. I mean, a lot of data centers are really patchworks of, of different systems. I mean. You know, what about open source cloud compatibility with you know Amazon Web Services or, or with you know with, with VMware? I mean, is, is the open source cloud really as, as interoperable as it needs to be? Devin, your sense on that? Yeah, it's uh, certainly a, it's an interesting topic. So um, when you start looking at API compatibility, it's you know it's important to be able to not try to displace a huge uh, uh, momentum around uh, existing APIs like the Amazon API. Um, at the same time, you also don't want to you don't want to necessarily be limited uh, to all of the ideas that came before. You want to have some room to innovate and move around as well. Uh, so I think when it comes to OpenStack, you know, there's both the OpenStack APIs and uh, support for the Amazon APIs as well. Uh, I think OpenStack could do um, could do a, a better job of focusing on on various API compatibilities, but you know, fundamentally, we don't want to be limited. Uh, by the decisions of large proprietary systems in terms of, of what we're going to do uh, in the future with our platform. Uh, when it comes to something like VMware, you know, that's a very interesting uh, case there as well. Um, the way that we kind of think about that is that traditionally with the kind of apps you would build on the VMware system, you know, those are systems that are traditionally unaware of the type of infrastructure they're running on. They're not cloud-enabled applications. So um, I think there are there's a lot of room for those those to coexist. And I think you're starting to see a lot of those kind of coexisting strategies emerging now around being able to build sort of net new greenfield applications, uh, elastic workloads in a private cloud uh, using uh, a system uh, like what we're all talking about here uh, alongside uh, VMware's more traditional infrastructure. So v VMware coexisting with with open source cloud really 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 comfortably in your view. 
Yeah, I think, I think that's what we're starting to see a lot of. I mean, there's been announcements from uh, people like PayPal talking about how they're doing a coexistence strategy uh, and setting up both of those types of infrastructure and, you know, migrating over time is a plan. Mm -hmm. Martin, somehow I think that interoperability is, is it would be close to your heart. And I think in the in the front page of the Eucalyptus website, it says something about AWS uh, compatibility. So I'm sensing this question is custom made for you somehow. Yes, uh, Eucalyptus was established to provide you with the power of cloud on your own servers and completely compatible with the leading public cloud. And our experience is that in every major software. Uh, industry or market that you have, you at some point get a, a standard and a dominant design. And I think whatever we think about Amazon, it's undeniable that AWS has become that for mm -hmm. infrastructure as a service. Right. So that's why we make sure Eucalyptus is fully compatible with AWS. You can move services back and forth like our customers do. AppDynamics and Riot Games and Rafter and Mosaic all do that. And, and we have a partnership with Amazon whereby they help us make sure that our APIs and the behavior matches what they have on the public cloud so that you can just move workloads in and out um, at any time. Peter, compatibility, I mean, do, do the yeah. customers run into problems where it's like, hey, we wanted to work with it, but it doesn't work with it as, as well as we thought it would? I mean, have you run right. into that kind of a thing? You know what, so I'm, I'm going to steal from an old Scott McNeely keynote that I watched where what he talked about was... Um, in this case, it was competitors, but we can use the analogy. And it, it, when looking at the intersection of the enterprise and the cloud, whether it's uh, VMware on the on-premise and, and Amazon in the public cloud, it's like watching um, two dump trucks in slow motion in a head-on collision. Uh, because without the interoperability and without the compatibility, you have users that have um, built technologies and solutions that work on either that are completely um, uh, mismanaged or at conflict with one another, another when the two meet. And we saw that as an opportunity inside of uh, CloudStack. Um, and so we focused on extending things inside of the enterprise. So today you can have uh, what we like to call uh, an enterprise scale cloud or, 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 or a web scale cloud or an Amazon style cloud um, managed those types of workloads managed um, under a single interface being cloud stack so you can have your your scale up um, uh, VMware stack or you can have a scale out uh, Amazon style on-prem in your private cloud uh, and then at the same time recognizing that these same tool sets are going to want to uh, take advantage of a lot of the public cloud resources that are out there. And in fact, many of our largest customers today um, uh, are effectively moving workloads back and forth between the private data center and their Amazon public cloud. And had we not focused on the interoperability, had we not focused on the ability to leverage some of those tool sets, we wouldn't have had those customers. So that um, that was something we made a decision very early on. It was uh, you know the whole concept of customer first development. People were asking for Amazon. Um, Martin was the guy who cornered uh, the, uh, the the certified version of that, but. Um, you know, we, we've done our best to make sure that we maintain interoperability and compatibility with the leading public cloud services out there. Mm -hmm. the, the the dump truck analogy, just so I'm clear, one one truck was VMware. What was the who was the other truck there? Uh, it, well, the Amazon public cloud, right? Because when uh, you look okay. at where developers yeah. are, you have your classic uh, IT ops in VMware. They're building app services and components there. At the same time, you have your your developers that are writing stuff in uh, in the Amazon service. Now, whether you're talking uh, security um, or whether you're talking style of app type of language, uh, construct of everything, the two are completely different from one another. And you know, the reality is while we can sit and talk about the two in isolation, they're quickly coming together. Um, and I think Lydia had a great, uh, Lydia Leon from Gartner had a great post, I think it was yesterday or the day before, where she talked about the fact that um, it, you know, similar to uh, the early days of the internet and the intranet, you know, they were separate, but today it's just the net. Um, the same thing's happening in the cloud, and you can't have isolated workloads where your user has to choose where they run based on understanding all of the underlying stuff. You have to be able to provide both types of services completely abstracted from your users so that they can run based on IT policy or, or what's going on inside of the business. Mm -hmm. And if you don't figure that out, those two dump trucks are going to smash into one another. <clears throat> and it's going to be painful. 
Gordon, uh, dump trucks in our pavility. I mean, do you, do you see a problem there? I mean, do, do you do you hear do you hear any horror stories of oh, you know, we we've got an open source a private open source cloud, but it doesn't really work the way we thought. It's it's not interoperability the way we thought. Do, do you ever hear that kind of a thing? Yeah, I mean, you know, first of all, the reality here is that we live in a hybrid world of IT. Right. You don't have homogeneous stacks, and we've got some proprietary vendors like VMware, for example who are saying they have hybrid cloud that's sort of hybrid as long as it's all VMware, whether private or public. And in Red Hat's view, that is not hybrid. That's just sort of another flavor of a proprietary silo. Now, one way place I'll disagree with um, Peter just a little bit with respect to abstracting away the underlying infrastructure is that there are different computing architectures out there. So you look at what are often called systems of record, the traditional uh, ERP systems and sort of big VMs which don't change very much long-lived and all that. And then you have these very distributed cloud applications with new design patterns. And I, I think it's fair to say that we will sometimes want different infrastructures to support those different types of workloads. And the key is really providing hybrid cloud management and portability on top of those heterogeneous infrastructures and providing a way to, for example, as more applications are written using cloud design patterns over time that users can migrate from existing infrastructures to those new infrastructures, but not just add additional silos, they're isolated from each other. So from uh, my perspective, sort of the portability and the freedom from lock-in are really the keys here. And, and Gordon, you and I are saying the same thing. I mean, you know, this isn't about talking you know, through the Oracle financials or SAP running on top of a, a cloud infrastructure. When I talk about the fact that dev test today, there still is significant work with regards to, um, uh, you know, the use of VMware and multi-tier applications in the enterprise in the same way that a developer is going to be asking for system resources um, uh, in that environment. They want to have the same tools and components and flexibility that they might have on uh, a cloud scale type um, uh, architecture as well. We should be able to abstract that um, and set policy because the last thing you want um, is if you don't give that 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 central single pane of control, you're going to have developers running web servers on the equivalent of a mainframe, which that economics doesn't necessarily work out. They might get the performance that they need. Who knows? But you, you know, you're not right-sizing a workload to the infrastructure underneath. Giving them too many portals and making them choose which yeah. it is, that also creates more headaches. So how do you create a unified experience that has the interoperability for the underlying architecture based on the workload that's going to run? Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. What about security here? I mean, you know, we hear a lot about security, especially you know, with the NSA revelations and, and Snowden. I mean, is can can open source provide a, a claim of better security than a proprietary cloud? Is there, or is it just a red herring either way? P Peter, what's your sense of that? You know, so I. Um I think it's probably a red herring either way, right? Uh, we're so early on in the cloud space. Um, yeah, sure, we're 10 plus years in, but I think you know, down in the layers that we play, we're so early on, we're learning about new things and, and, and the market changing so much that I can't necessarily say that I'm going to give you better security against the NSA than the next guy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, you know, I, I think this comes back to um, uh, Working on best practices for about securing your data center and data center services the same way you would proprietary or not or open um, web services or even hosted data centers. It it, it all comes into uh, how you set it up and practice it yourself. But there's not going to be a sense, and, and Devin, please take a swing if you if you would. There's not going to be a sense of hey, you know, if if a hacker can see the code, if it's going to be more open, that makes it more vulnerable. Is that, is that an old tired argument or? Open source and security, what's your sense of that? Yeah, I've never really bought that argument personally because they're going to find the exploits one way or another. But if you have an open source community around, they can actually go and fix them much yeah. quicker. So uh, it's all about having a, a healthy process around how you actually patch vulnerabilities and uh, embargo the announcements and all these kinds of standard practices. But, you know, really when we're talking about security in the cloud, I mean, that's a huge topic. And, you know, open source software just by itself is not any more or less secure than proprietary software, but it's about the community and the type of interactions uh, and how we are able to fix and identify uh, vulnerabilities and then how we can be transparent about them. 
So if you have a question about how something works and whether or not something is properly secured, you can and actually you can actually go look at the code and and for your own sake get reasonably comfortable that, that that's good code. You know, and we we also we also focus a lot on on the software itself, but it's about the entire system. I mean, it's from you know the data center to the physical hardware to uh, securing the hypervisor and securing uh, the kernel and there's all these different layers and the very last layer on top of that is is the actual cloud management software so um, th there, there's a number of, of, of layers there that we have to be concerned with but um, fundamentally you know there's a security group in the OpenStack community uh, that goes through and actually does security audits on the code uh, publishes their findings uh, they do, you know, sprints to go through and fix the bugs. Uh, they publish actual, you know, books on security uh, for OpenStack uh, for everyone to benefit from in terms of best practices. So, you know, it's not a it's not a binary yes no. This is more secure. It's about the framework that we have to enable us to be more secure in the long run, and to be able to I think prove that. So, uh, there, there's no there's no magic silver bullet uh, for security here, but uh, I think I think when you are able to go and look at the code and have proper uh, processes and a community that really uh, rallies behind those efforts, I, I think everybody wins. Mm -hmm. Martin, security I mean, is it? Can open source really make a claim of better security, or not really? Absolutely, <clears throat> it has been shown already over a decade that open source software, on average, has fewer vulnerabilities per line of code or per thousand lines of code than closed source code. So tests by Coverity and others. And at Eucalyptus, we have a security team. We have a responsible security manager. We fix them very quickly. And it's very important that the world can help us fix it, because at the end of the day, there are more good guys than bad guys. And the bad guys get access anyhow. But when you give the good guys access, you get better security. And let's remember that private cloud is a question of giving customers control over their own cloud. To give them complete control, you also give them the source code. And they, they don't have to change it, but they can validate it and verify it for themselves and make sure that there are no loopholes, no hidden back doors, or nothing in there. And you never know with closed source code what's inside. You can never know. Gordon, uh, security, open source, what, yeah. what's your sense on that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think sort of the, the this old saw about, you know, oh, if people can see the source code, you know, that'll make things less secure. I mean, that, that's been pretty effectively disproven. I think I first time. heard that in, like, 2004. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I mean, it, and it came about because people who didn't, frankly, know very much about security penetrations in software and the like, which are like, well, a bank doesn't publish the blueprints for its alarm system. Well, so, there you go. Sure. You know, so it's it's, there, it's the same thing we're talking about. Of course, that's that's nonsense. I mean, uh, uh, so you know, that, that makes absolutely no sense. And more, as Martin has said, there's actually been a lot of studies that have shown in many cases, for many comparisons, open source software can actually be more secure. I, I do want to emphasize a point that Peter made, though, about you know, kind of talking about security or really broader issues of compliance and audit and so forth. Is this is a very big, complicated subject. If you look at somebody like the Cloud Security Alliance has published a basically a model for people to follow that organizations can follow. Uh, to look at security and compliance issues, and it's got, I forget the number, but something like at least a hundred different points for people to look at and subsets to each of those. So I would really encourage for anybody who is really kind of thinking about security to look at some of these models that are out there, like the Cloud Security Alliances, and really go through it in detail. And uh, you know there, there are a variety of open source cloud platforms or consortiums. I mean, there, there's there's OpenStack, there's, there's CloudStack, there's, there's Open Nebula. I mean, is there is there a reason for a company that's out there exploring to to align with, with one or, or the other? I mean, uh, Martin, you, well, well, I mean, I, I sense you might have a vested interest in this, but what why why would someone w want to align with one? Or, or first of all, why are there so many? And uh, is is there a good reason to align with one or the other? I think there are so many because it's such a massive business opportunity and there's a ton of smart engineers out there who all would like to create their own. And yes, they do differ from each other and it's all about what you need. 
um, if you need to go live and go production very quickly, if you need to manage your cloud without an army of people uh, taking care of it all the time, and if you need to be compatible with Amazon as a cloud, then I have the perfect private cloud software for you, and it's called Eucalyptus. <laughs> but I also have huge respect for OpenStack, Open Nebula, CloudStack. Uh, they have their own value propositions and their own priorities that they are following. So I think it's up to, to you as a user to decide what's important to you. Peter, I mean, is there? I guess it's it's a similar question. Is you know the four of you in a sense do compete? Is there is there one reason to, to go with with one vendor or another? I mean, what what is it that sets sets you guys apart? Considering there's these different platforms and what? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know what? I I think at the end of the day, it's going to be important for uh, whoever is going to be managing this stuff and using this stuff to be comfortable with it. And the good news about um, open source platforms is the fact that you can go download the code for free, you can engage with the community for free, you can try it out for free, um, and, and you have a good opportunity to really see which one um, uh, fits your specific need. You know, as, as Martin mentioned, he's got a great relationship with Amazon. Uh, that might be something that, that is um, uh, extremely critical for you uh, within your organization. In the OpenStack world, there are many, many IT vendors that have, have supported the platform and, you know, there, there's options to, to um, uh, see that that, might, that relationship might be the best opportunity for you. We like to think um, with CloudStack that we've seen some fairly significant successes at all different uh, types of companies. Um, running production workloads today. So where where one might have a great Amazon relationship, one might have a great uh, IT ecosystem, we've got a great user ecosystem. And uh, many companies, like even today, Disney is sharing at um, one of the local conferences how they set up and run some of their public services based on top of CloudStack. And that's, that's where I think we have the value is people who have gone before you uh, can help you get to production a lot faster. But I do think at the end of the day, um, you know, four great projects, uh, easily accessible code, get engaged and see which one seems to work best for your organization is probably going to be the most important thing for you. De Devin, why, why would a company that's out there shopping around, why would they you know, choo choose Nebula over, over one of the many other great offerings? Yeah, like they said, there's a, there's a huge business opportunity in this space. There's a number of different platforms out there. Um, and for us, you know, the value proposition we bring is you can buy a private cloud with OpenStack and Amazon APIs and be up and running very, very quickly with a secure environment, uh, with a great uh, ecosystem around and partners. Uh, as, as far as OpenStack itself, I mean, there's a, there's a number of ways to get started with that. Uh, one of the great things OpenStack has going for it is the amazing amount of companies and users and developers that have rallied around it in the past few years. So uh, for, for such a young project, you know, we have... Uh, an amazing amount of momentum, uh, an amazing amount of, uh, we're starting to see a, a lot of adoption at this point, especially in the enterprise. And, uh, you know, you, you, it's hard to go a week without hearing a, a, a new story about, about someone uh, in the large, a large enterprise is to deploying OpenStack at this point. So uh, there's a lot of momentum there, and uh, <clears throat> I think it'll keep going. <laughs> Gordon, why, why, why Red Hat? Why, why your camp as opposed to those other, those other yeah. camps out there? There's a lot of camps, a lot of confusion. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I, I probably disagree slightly with one statement that you made, was you know, why are there so many of them? Good. Uh, yeah. I, w I would actually argue that this space has coalesced more quickly than I might have predicted that it would uh, couple, three years ago, uh, because you know, I, th I think a lot of it's really being driven by the de you know, kind of the developer community and the fact that there has been a coalescing of uh, you know, kind of developer focus, company focus around, I, I would argue, actually a relatively small number of projects here. And, you know, in you know I would sort of echo everything Devin said about OpenStack broadly. I, I think that it's arguably less mature than some of the other offerings you can purchase today. However, there's, in fact, if you look at kind of what's happened in the last 18 months, there's actually been an incredible amount of advancement there and uh, an enormous pace of change. And I think that pace of change can make things look a little bit messy today. But, you know, this ultimately is about 
developer communities and user communities and you know kind of where the biggest throw weight is and I, I would argue that OpenStack is is really on is kind of on the strongest trajectory there and you know what why Red Hat well we have a broad portfolio of cloud products you know, beyond infrastructure as a service and we just have a lot of um, experience in doing this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you guys have said a lot of good stuff. I guess I just a, sort of a fast wrap up. I mean, what would you say if, if you had just a, a tiny nugget of advice for a company that's out there that's looking for a solution? What what should they be asking? Not, not so much choosing a vendor, but what should they be asking as they go out there and they look through what is a pretty confusing array of products? What, what what's what's maybe one thing they should be thinking about? Uh, Peter, any, any sense of that? Uh, you know what, so uh, I've said it a number of times, you don't need a cloud strategy, you need an IT strategy and pick the best cloud that's going to fit into that model for you. Um, I've been, you know, I've said it a couple of times, uh, there's not a lot of uh, resource required to try out any of these platforms out here. Align um, uh, your ability to try them out, use them and see how they fit within your IT strategy and, and, and that's where you move forward. I think there's a lot of great resources out there um, uh, both in OpenStack and Eucalyptus and in CloudStack to help you get there. I just suggest that you try them all. You know, a moment ago you actually said something about you can try them for free. I mean, in, in the real world can a company really set up its own private cloud even if the software is, so, is, is free? So, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll be clear, I'm a marketing guy, right? I've set up all three of these platforms. If the marketing guy can do it, for Christ's sake, I would hope <laughs> okay. that, you know, anyone else out there can. There, there, there's been a lot of advancement in the installers and the implementations, and you know what? If you don't have a cloud to run it on, the great news is all three of us can be run on top of Amazon as well. So, you know, you, can, you don't have to pay for hardware. You don't have to pay for the software. You might have to spend a little bit of time downloading the stuff and reading a few documents, but at the end of the day, the help's there for you, so I'd highly suggest that you try all of them. Martin, what advice would you give to someone out there shopping? If it's confusing, what, what would you say to them? Well, I would say try it out, and we, we have shown how you build a 12-core private cloud for the cost of $1,650 for hardware and everything, so that's not much. Um, so try it out and make sure you have a solution where you can move the workloads to and from the public cloud. Mm -hmm. De Devin, a little a nugget of advice for someone out there trying to sift through all this? Yeah, first of all, it's all about the, it's all about the work you're trying to do at the end of the day. So um, it's about the type of application, uh, how you're actually planning to deploy those applications. And fundamentally, uh, I think the most important thing to, to know up front is whether you're trying to do a cloud services engagement or if you're trying to really just deploy your own cloud and manage it. There's a, a lot of companies out there that will do you know, sort of consulting style engagements to get you up and running, but uh, it can be a lot quicker to do it our way. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, Gordon, what, what's your nugget of advice for people? Technology is easy, people are hard. <laughs> and what, what, I, what, I mean, what I mean by that is, you know, as Peter and others here have said, it's, you know, it's really pretty easy to try this stuff out on, you know, kind of a sandbox sort of method, uh, and that's great. But if we're really talking about kind of a cloud or IT strategy here really need to think about what's trying to be accomplished here and how it gets done organizationally within a company you know what you know what silos need to be broken down what kind of alignments need to be made between the line of business and the IT executives because if you don't do those kind of things you're not going to end up having a successful pro project that benefits the company, no matter how well the technology works uh, down in a sandbox in the IT department someplace. Right. The, the, the man management has to buy into it at any rate. You know, yeah. and, and Gordon, you bring up a good point. I think, you know, I, I've started to see some of this come out of the OpenStack camp, but I do think, um, you know, putting together potential users with people that have been successful at doing this is extremely important. Um, uh, every uh, you know, almost every month we hold sessions, whether they're webinars or in-person sessions, where people can listen from those guys that have deployed CloudStack at scale, from service providers to entertainment web companies to classic enterprises. And the good news is 
Um, and, and this is the power of open communities. Uh, the guys that are deploying this stuff are perfectly happy to work with others in the industry and teach them about the pitfalls they've seen, the organizational um, uh, requirements and practices that they needed to put in place, and the process that they took to go from proof of concept into a in a closet to a 50,000 server uh, cluster driving significant business for the overall company. So I think that's a big part of this is, is not only try the code, but engage with those guys that have gone and, and, and had a chance to build these before you because you're not the first. Yeah, yeah I, I had a day with a couple of analysts from one of the major industry analyst firms a few weeks ago and one of the points they made was a lot of first generation private cloud projects failed not even so much necessarily because of the technology but because companies approached yeah. them or the vendors approached it as you know let's just add some management on top of virtualization and call the cloud and call it a day and ultimately those didn't deliver the benefits that people wanted so it really takes this broader IT view and really a new way of thinking about things like delivering IT services right a lot of great stuff. I appreciate the four of you sharing your expertise. I will uh, send you all a link. Should be the next day or so, and uh, we can all promote it and tweet it together. There we uh, go. Thanks again, and uh, I'll talk to you all soon. Thanks, Thanks again. Thanks, James. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Right. <laughs> <laughs>